Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Lerna said, I'm Craig McAdam. I'm the national recorder for um, Mayflies, and I uh, also run the, Mayfly, uh, the Stonefly recording scheme as well. In my spare time, my day job is conservation director with Bug Life, the Invertebrate Conservation Trust. Um, but today I'm presenting to you as, as national recorder for Mayflies, and I'm going to give an introduction to adult Mayflies. I'm going to start with a summary of their history, their life cycle and ecology, before giving an overview of their identification and highlighting some of the species you may encounter. And finally, I'll show you how you can collect and record adult mayflies. So in the UK, in across the world, there's around 3,200 species. Um, in the UK, we've got 53 species, so a very small group, something that's really manageable to to identify and uh, to get used to. We don't have any endemic species in the UK. Um, we don't have any subspecies in the UK. Um, so we're just, we're just concerned with the 53 species. Mayflies have uh, a long uh, history. Uh, they're thought to have evolved in the late Carboniferous period. This one here is from Kansas uh, and is from around 280 to 290 million years uh, ago. You can see here the, at the bottom of the screen the, the tails that are characteristic of mayflies today. But you can also see that both the forewings and the hindwings are the same size, more like a dragonfly, um, uh, a modern dragonfly. Uh, and in, in, the, in these ancient times, the, the mayflies had the same size wings. Um, those wings have reduced over time, and so we can... We can uh, how we can look at the age of the, the mayfly from the, the size of the wings. If we move forward a little bit to uh, the Miocene period, this is about 15 to 20 million years ago, and this is a piece of amber which has trapped two, uh, two mayflies in it and a full grid grub at the, a bug at the bottom there. And these are a male and a female um, mayfly which uh, was found in an amber bed in Mexico. And it's, it's fairly unusual to get one of both, both uh, sexes in, in a piece. Um, and the way that the amber preserves them means that you can see detail that you just can't see in, in normal um, rock fossils. So that's 20 million years ago. Um, if we look at when the first records of mayflies come into the, into the uh, written record, we actually have a huge, a long history of, of people talking about mayflies. This is a, a, a series of clay tablets um, which form the Epic of Gilgamesh. And uh, Gilgamesh was a, a, a ruler in ancient Babylonia um, who thought he was immortal and uh, thought he could never be beaten in battle. And this was a poem that was written about him um, and there's a reference to mayflies in there. It says, ever the river has risen and brought us the flood, the mayfly floating on the water, on the face of the sun, its countenance gazes, then all of a sudden nothing is there. And it's talking about the, the brief life of an adult mayfly and how this ruler, Gilgamesh, would have such a brief life as well. Uh, quite astonishingly, we can actually hazard a guess at what mayfly this was, even though it was 2000 BC. Um, Thomas Soldan did some detective work and looked at other pieces of uh, literature around that period and was able to piece together the, the, the size of the mayfly and the kind of habit of the mayfly and when it, when it was on the wing. And he, um, he, uh, he sort of like proposed that it was this species here, which is uh, Mortogenesia mesopotamica, which was described by a Scottish entomologist, uh, Kenneth Morton, from specimens from the Euphrates River. So it all fits in. It's a large species that's on the wing in February um, when this, this uh, uh, species is, is um, thought to have been around. And these are the actual des descriptions on the left from the, the paper that you wrote about this. And on the right are the slides in the collection in the, the museum in Edinburgh, which actually were used to um, create the, slide, uh, the description. So that was 2000 BC. If we bring it forward a bit to uh, ancient Greece in 350 BC, Aristotle wrote about mayflies. 
he wrote about an insect that lives and flies about until the evening, but as the sun goes down, it pines away and dies at sunset, having lived just one day. And again, it's talking about that brief adult life of a mayfly. Um, bringing it forward again, 200 AD, um, Claudius Alenus, um, who was a, a Roman poet, described speckled fish feeding on flies that hover above the river Astraeus. And again, we've got a good idea what this may be from the species that live in that river and the, the habit that that hover, um, which is mass emergence of these mayflies, Oligonuella um, species, a mass emergence of them, and they, they move backwards and forwards up the river. So again, we, we, you, we can probably guess roughly what species this is. Coming forward quite a, a bit further now, um, Clitius uh, described the life cycle of mayflies. He got it a bit wrong. This was in 1634. He, he noted that they had a, a larval form and an adult form, but he also put in a pupil form because he couldn't work out how they got from the larval form in the water to the, the, uh, the adult in the air. And perhaps the most um, significant description, though, in the, that period was by Swammerdam, who was a, a European worker uh, in, in Holland, in the Netherlands. And he described the natural history and the anatomy of the ephemeron, a fly that lives but five hours. And this um, was a description, a very, a very precise description of what that, that species did. And that species was Palangenia longicorda. So Palangenia longicorda is the largest mayfly in Europe. Um, it is now restricted to the River Danube and its tributaries, and um, pretty patchy distribution as well. Um, uh, and it emerges in, in huge quantities. It's uh, on the River Teaser, it's called the, the blooming of the teaser, where these mayflies um, all come out at once and the river comes to life. And it's celebrated there, it's celebrated in uh, Folk music, it's celebrated in, in various sculptures and things around, around the, the river. And also on a, this bridge, which is the Tisa Virag Brig Bridge, which is the, the, the Tisa Mayfly Bridge, and it's said to be designed to look like a mayfly. Um, unfortunately, uh, we've, there's been some uh, studies done that show that this mayfly doesn't like bridges. It tends to turn back when it gets to a bridge and won't go under them. So perhaps celebrating it with a bridge was perhaps not the best idea. Plus it's all lit up, which will probably attract them away from the river as well. Linnaeus um, named a lot of mayflies, described a lot of mayflies uh, in his, his works, his Systema Naturae. Um, he described uh, species that we have in this country, and as we'll see later on, um, he, he described the pond olive, Chloeum diptrum, he described the, the iron blue dun, the uh, uh, Betis muticus, and various others, and was, a, was the first person to really put proper descriptions to these species. 1771, Gilbert White wrote about uh, mayflies and their, their dancing at the side of the, uh, at the river, uh, the chalk streams. Um, he gave an account of one particular species, which he called Ephemera cod of Bicetta, but Bicetta, as we would call uh, Ephemera danica now. Um, he, he, he was a great naturalist and, um, and talked about a lot of spectacles in nature, um, and this was just one of them. Curtis, uh, John Curtis was a, an entomologist who um, was incredibly, did these incredibly detailed descriptions and, and drawings. Um, he wrote uh, a, a paper on uh, a various, various species of, of mayflies and included it with these, these illustrations, which are absolutely fantastic. And, and they, some of them come up on, online occasionally, um, but they're usually snapped up quite quickly. Um, the, the book that he wrote um, were, is just stunning. He, he, he described a whole uh, load of different insects um, right the way across all, all orders um, and with these fantastic illustrations. Well worth a look if you can go to the Royal Entomological Society or the Natural History Museum and, and see it. Now, up to this time, um, mayflies were called various names. They were, they were, they were either called ephemerons or ephemerids, or uh, um, sometimes they were, they, they were given other names as well. There was the, the name mayfly wasn't used to, to describe them all. It was, was used to, uh, in, on occasion, it was used to describe the, the larger ones in the UK, the, 
uh, ephemera species. Um, and and th that changed in 18 1883 when the Reverend Alf Alfred Eaton um, wrote his uh, his monograph on 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 uh, ephemeroptera, and he he was the first one to use the name mayflies to mean all ephemeroptera. And this this uh, this book is about you know thirty to forty uh, millimeters deep. Um, it's a big book, and um, it's still a bible for uh, for mayfly workers. You know, I've got a copy here that I look at probably once or twice uh, a month um, just to look up a, a description. He described every species that was known um, in the world at that time. So it was really a, a really important book. Um, and his collection is in the Natural History Museum. So you can actually go and look at the specimens that he was describing these from. So mayflies aren't just the preserve of entomologists. Um, they've been used by anglers for um, many years as well. They've been known by anglers for many years. Um, this book in, in 1486, Dame Juliana Berners, who was the count, uh, the abbess of, um, oh gosh, uh, abbess of St Albans, um, she wrote this uh, this book here, which was the Treatise of Fishing with an Angle. So it was a it was a description of how to fish, how what what equipment you should use, where you should fish, um, what you might catch, and importantly, she also looked at what the flies looked like, what the artificial flies that she was using to catch fish, she described them. And she described them in terms of the, the materials that she was using to, uh, to make these artificial flies. And we can take from her, she gave a fly for um, every month of the year. We can take from what she said and um, how she describes them. We can actually hazard a guess at what species she was talking about. So she talks in March of the dun fly, the body of dun wool and the wings of the partridge. Some partridge wing, partridge feathers are, are, are speckled. Um, this is probably one of the early flies that uh, come out into the, into the, the uh, of rivers at that time, which is Ruthigena germanica, the March brown, or the, oops, I thought I had a picture of that, um, or Ecgionis torrentis, which is the um, large brook dun. And they both have these speckled wings and that dark body. In May, she talks about the yellow fly, the body of yellow wool, the wings of red cock's hackle and of drake dyed yellow. And this is almost certainly Hectogenia sulfurea, the yellow may done. Um, it's a yellow fly with a reddish thorax. Um, it's almost certainly this fly that she's seeing. And they, they come off in quite large numbers in May. And in June, she talks about the dun cut, and this is the body of black wool, a yellow stripe along either side, the wings of the buzzard bound on with hemp that's been treated with tan bark. So a dark fly with this yellow streak along its, uh, along its side. And this species here is known by anglers as the dusky yellow streak because of this, um, this sort of stripe of yellow along its, below its wings here. Um, so, Almost certainly she's talking about this as well. It fits with the timing as well. So that's a bit of a, a potted history of mayflies. Um, what I'm going to do now is to talk a little bit about their life cycles. As with everything, it starts with the eggs. Um, and the um, female adult mayfly is simply an egg carrier. All the internal organs have been pushed to the side and her, her abdomen is full of eggs. And even the smallest species can have two or three thousand uh, eggs in them, uh, in a, in a female. The larger ones, the the ephemera danica, can have up to eight thousand eggs per individual. And they lay these in different ways. They'll lay them either by dropping them um, in a little ball onto the water surface, or dipping their abdomen in the, in the water to release some at a time, um, to various other methods. When the eggs are released, they start to drop out of the current. They, they drop down into the into the bed, um, and they have these little structures and and um, attachments that allow them to stick to the bed of the river or the bed of the the water. Um, in many of these, this is just a sticky surface um, of the eggs. The, the cap of the egg may be sticky, but uh, in others, they're quite distinctive and can even be used to identify the species um, 
in some cases. So all these all these structures just the minute they get wet, they they um, they appear. There's some of the species, the the beta day, um, particularly the beta species, that actually go one step further and they make sure that their eggs are stuck to the to a, a good place in the river. The female will actually land on an exposed stone and pull herself through the surface of the water and lay her eggs on directly onto the the underside of the stone. And this is a stone from a river near me here, um, where a mayfly has gone down. And each one of these patches has maybe a thousand eggs or something in it. They've got the, where the, the uh, female has laid the eggs individually into these little patches. If you look a bit closer, you can see they're just packed with thousands of eggs. Um, and this can, you know, if you've not got many stones in a river um, or, you, or you've got, you know, a, 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 a upright or something that um, a bridge support or whatever the, the the these can be actually covered in layer after layer of these eggs and um, which then hatch out and you get things like caddis flies and, and other invertebrates coming in and grazing on these to to get at the the protein that they contain the eggs once they develop the uh, once they they're laid they develop depending on temperature um, so most most of them have a, a fairly set uh, incubation period, depending on temperature. This here is an egg um, of Ephemera danica, and we're just going to follow it through its development. Um, it, as you can see here, you can start to see some shapes appearing. You start to see the shape of the body appearing there. Um, there's, uh, there's various sort of different changes happening within that egg. Um, at this point, you can start to see the the abdominal segments, the body segments starting to appear there. There's the eyes now appeared. Um, and then again, you can see it all, all curled up in there, ready to, to hatch out. And then it hatches out. And when it hatches out, it looks it looks a bit like a silverfish. Um, it's, it's not got gills down the side yet. It's got, uh, you can see the three tails that are characteristic of all um, mayfly larvae. Uh, in the UK, you can see the, the antennae and the, the legs. But apart from that, it looks pretty much like a, a, a very primitive insect. And that one that we saw there was Ephemera danica, and you can see that it, it follows a fairly um, uh, constant development. It just goes through and it develops uh, in these stages depending on temperature. The one in the bottom is the blue winged olive, uh, Ceratella igniter, and you can see that it develops in the same way until it gets to a point. And after that sixth sort of like stage there, it stops. It goes into what's called diapause, which is a kind of suspended animation. Um, so these eggs are laid by the, the blue winged olive in July, and it will develop all the way through to September, October, and then it will stop. And it's stuck to the bottom. You can actually see the attachment structure there on this one, which is a little sort of blob at the bottom of the egg. It's stuck on the bed um, and it will stay in that suspended animation stage, that diapause, right through the winter. When it, um, if it was a larvae, it might get washed away or it could be affected by high floods or, or, or whatever. It stays in that stage all the way through the winter until about April when, this, when the water temperature starts to rise a little and then they hatch out, they start developing again and they hatch out straight away. And then they develop very quickly over the summer to, to lay their eggs again, to mate and lay their eggs again. So, um, but what's interesting is that as we are getting uh, warmer summer, uh, warmer winters, we're also seeing that some of these populations are actually do, not needing that diapause. They're going straight the way through and we might get two generations in a year. Certainly in some of the chalk streams in the south of England, there are two generations of this species. And I've had um, mature larvae in, in very early in the year in some of the streams in Scotland. And that points to there's something going on there that um, might, it's almost certainly weather uh, climate related. So once they've hatched out these, these tiny little primitive insects, um, these, these first instar mayflies, they don't hang about on the surface of the water, they go down to the gravels. And this is just a, 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 a a diagram of a typical river system. And you can see in the bottom inset, uh, in the bottom right, this is what's termed the hyperreic flow. This is the water that flows underneath the river. 
um, you've got the water that we see and you've got this lots of water flowing underneath the river through the gravels and often quite far away from the um, from the actual river channel itself. So in the top figure, you can see these uh, dotted arrows, which are actually where there's water flowing from the river through gravels in the floodplain and then appearing back in the river in different places. And this hyperreic zone, this, this, this water underneath the river, is incredibly important for freshwater insects, uh, freshwater invertebrates. Um, the mayflies go down, the, the these tiny mayflies go down and they, they live in there for the first few instars. Um, some of the some of the stoneflies will live in there right through and then just appear to uh, just appear on the surface to to emerge out as adults. But the, the mayflies go down there. We've sampled um, the hyperreic zone and found mayfly larvae, betis larvae, um, as far as a meter down into this gravel. So it's it's really important. Um, you know, you you when you collect them out and you put them into a, a little jar. You don't think there's anything in there. You just shake it slightly, and you'll you'll see this, this slight sort of snow snow globe sort of effect with these little uh, larvae moving around. The larvae, um, as we saw, are are streamlined in most cases. This is a, a betis larvae, a betidae larvae, and we can see the three tails, which are characteristic of mayflies in the UK. We can see the three pairs of legs and the relatively long antennae in this, this particular species. And one of, the, one of the features of mayflies, which is uh, easily uh, uh, seen, are these gills down the side of the body. These are used to take oxygen from the water. Um, the, the, the shape of the gill is really important when you're identifying larvae. And typically there are seven pairs of gills, but some are, uh, sometimes they're, they're hidden underneath one big gill, or they're uh, in different shapes and different different uh, arrangements, um, but generally they are this this uh, you know this is the kind of uh, plan of a, a mayfly. You can see on the back of this one these two pointed um, structures just here. These are the wing pads, and you can actually see if you look closely, you can see the little veins of the wings already in there. And the, the wings are all wrapped up in there, really parceled up like a, like a parachute, if you like, um, that when, when they're fully developed, um, these wing pads will turn black and then the larvae will come up to the surface and, and the, the wings will be unfurled. Not all of them have this body shape. Um, so these are, these are um, streamlined and swimming larvae. Some have a much more flattened uh, body shape. This is one of the heptogenidae. And this is these these species live in in very fast flowing water, so they're adapted to to that. They've got flattened heads that that push the water over them. They've got uh, the, these the the legs are flattened and and turned to the back. You can see here how how flat and uh, how water will just go straight across it. They've also got on the pronotum a little flange here. This particular uh, genus has a, a sort of flange out here, which again, just helps to push the water over them. And it just, it, it's to keep them really streamlined to the, to the, to the bed. Um, some of these species have got other adaptations like their gills all overlap, which makes them incredibly difficult to actually get off, um, off a rock or off a, a tree once you've sampled them. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're incredibly good at holding on. They'll always face into the current, um, so if you turn a stone round, they'll all quickly hurry round and, and face themselves into the current so they can get that, that force down onto them to keep them in, the, in, in place. Different um, species have different, uh, uh, different sort of like tolerances to, to fast flowing water. It's all about the velocity of the water. And um, so different species have, have different uh, tolerances and, and, and abilities to stay in that. That species that I was talking about, which has the, the gills that are all overlapping is, is Rithrogena semicolorata. And you can see that it just stays on no matter how, how fast it is. This is the, the along the bottom here is the shear stress. And basically it just, does, just stays there um, uh, as, long as, it, as long as it wants. Other species are, are uh, like Sabeta sudani and Ectineurus, are um have have are okay to a point and then drop off 
And then other species like this down here, Amelitis and Opinatus, which is another mayfly, it prefers the slower flowing water. And you can see that its, its ability to stay in place in faster flowing water um, shows you why it, it, it prefers the, the slower pools and, and glides. And the mayflies go through um, a number of molts in common with all the arthropods. And um, they've got this outer scale, exoskeleton that in order to grow, they've got to molt it. Um, and each time they do this is called an instar. There can be up to 50 instars in some mayflies. So they, they molt all this time um, just to allow them to grow to the size that they need to grow to. Um, this is an um, ephemera danica larvae molting. And you can see that the on the, the left hand side there, that's the, the uh, specimen and it is, um, it's very pale because it's not got, it's not had time to harden up and once it hardens up some of the colour comes back um, and that's that's one of the things that you need to watch that you when you're identifying larvae that you, you look at the physical features rather than the colour features because they can be slightly different and um, they don't feed during this molting period so they'll they'll stop feeding just before it and then they'll to wait until they've hardened up before they start moving around again, because at that time they're, they're pretty vulnerable to being uh, predated. Once they've done all these molts and they've got to uh, their, their outsize, their wings have grown in these wing pads and these uh, sort of uh, parachute um, pack on the back, uh, it's time for it to get out of the water and become an adult. Um, emergence at the surface of the water is, is very quick. The, um, the, the larvae will, will have a couple of practice runs. It will sit on the bed and it will swim up to the surface and then float back down. It'll do that a couple of times before it, it goes for it. And it comes up to the surface. Um, and as it does, as it hits the surface, the back of the thorax will actually split open. And the, the adult inside is covered in tiny little hairs which repel the, the water and open up this window for it to actually come out on, which you can see in this picture, it's just doing that. And it'll actually climb out, out using the surface tension to pull itself out of the, the larval um, skin. And it'll sit on the, the water surface and pump up its wings, which are all sort of crushed up in the, uh, put, folded up in those um, wing pads. They'll come out and they'll, they'll pump those wings up and let them harden for a moment before flying off of the water. And in, at this time of year, we've got species that will be emerging just now. And that can take quite a while because it's just not warm enough in the in the air, and they'll actually float down the river, which is you know if you if you see a hatch of uh, Beta sudani or Rithrogena germanica at this time of year, there's always a flock of seagulls and and fish um, feeding on them because there's just this this constant stream of uh, adults coming down the river. Some of this emergence can happen in huge numbers. Um, this is a moth trap that was uh, put out at the side of Windermere. And there was sort of this, uh, it looked like smoke coming across the, the lake, um, but it wasn't, it was, actually, it was actually insects. And they came into this trap here and you can see absolutely hundreds of mayflies and a few chronomid midges. So th this was, this is a, a species called Canis, which, um, which uh, lives in the, the silt and the, the sand in the, in the lake and then emerges en masse at night and is attracted to lights. And round about a quarter of the species um, in the UK are actually attracted to light. So as we'll see later on, light trapping can be a good method to actually look for some of these species. Um, that's, that's relatively small though, that hatch. In the, in the States, there are some huge hatches of mayflies. Um, a species called uh, Hexagenia limbata hatches in, in huge numbers. And this is just a sequence of weather radar. The, 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 the hatches are so big that they can be picked up by, by rain radar, basically. And this is at uh, Loch, uh, Lake St. Clair. Uh, and you can see here the, the, the coloured patches are the start of the hatch. And these images are 20 minutes apart. And you see that the, the, the swarm starts to build. So that's the females and the, the males coming back. This is probably the, the, the males already starting just now. And the males usually come out first and then the females will join the swarm later. And you can see here it's moving northwards. And again, and at this point you can see the two mating swarms. 
So this is where the, the, the that really intense is where the, all these mayflies are are together in their mating uh, in their mating dance, and then uh, about an hour later we get them back over the the lake, and that's the females coming back to lay their eggs. So so this is this is something that you can pick up um, on on radar, and this is what it looks like in real life. There's huge numbers of these. Something that reckon to be about 18 trillion of these mayflies come off uh, the Mississippi every year. They are attracted to lights. They um, they land on surfaces. Um, there's warning sirens go off when the hatch starts, so people can close their doors. They use snow plows to move them off the roads. Um, it's it's a it's a huge event in the mayflies life cycle, but it also impacts upon humans and it happens around about the 4th of July when there's lots of lights and lots of people about. Um, the, uh, this is a, a, a hatch on the Mississippi, you can see the, the size of that hatch there, that was in uh, it, towards the end of July and that's a, a, an animation of the hatch as it happens at La Crosse in Wisconsin. It's not just the US that this happens. We have got some species in Europe that hatch in these sort of numbers. There, uh, these are just two road signs, which um, warn people of the fact that there's mayflies about, and one in Germany and one in in France. Uh, the the species that comes off, uh, there's a couple of species that come off in large numbers. Ephraim virgo, which is there, um, you can see that's a that's a road that is completely covered in in mayflies. Um, they're attracted to light, so you know lit bridges are a particularly uh, bad place for, for these mayflies. They get attracted there and away from the river. The um, When they hatch out of the water, you know, they, as I said, they, they hatch out from the larval stage and, and as, uh, they actually are unique in having two adult stages. So when they hatch out, the, the winged adult, the, the winged insect that is there on the surface of the water and, and flies off to the shore, isn't the final stage. In fact, it's it, it's it's more technically correct to call that another stage of the larvae, but we call it a subimago. Um, and these subimagos are generally a duller color than the um, the final adult. You can see here, this is a male of Potamanthus luteus. You can see that it's got relatively short front legs. The tails are relatively short, and we can see it's a male because it's got this little, these little forceps here underneath its tails, and the wings are opaque, so they're, they're, they've, they've got colour in them, and, and you can't see through them. And what this species, what this 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 subimago will do is it will fly off to the, the shore, and it'll find somewhere to rest, maybe in some vegetation or on a tree or or or, on, or somewhere else, and it will actually sit there and it will wait for the evening um, or the, the, the dawn the next again day and it will then molt again. And what they do is they'll they'll sit there and they'll um, they'll start by flattening out their wings. They'll flatten their wings to the side and as they do that the thorax starts to split open again and then the imago inside there will actually pull itself out and and then uh, uh, and then emerge as the, the final adult, the sexually mature adult. And it really is as quick as that. It happens incredibly quickly. Um, the, you, can, you can fool them into doing this if you get a subimago. You can put it in a little uh, watertight tube or, or, or box and then stick it in your fridge for, for five minutes or so. And that will mimic the cool night temperature and the dark. And when you bring it out, if you're lucky, they'll, they'll then emerge as the as the subimago, and you'll see that happen in front of you. Some species will do that incredibly quickly. Uh, this is one of the Canis species. Um, all the, the Canis uh, are active at night, and the subimago stage is really short, um, about two minutes in the case of this species. I've actually been in a river at night in waders and seen them crawling up my, my wader leg and actually emerging as they're crawling up. So by the time they get out of the water at my knees sort of level, time they get to my hip, they've already emerged and they're an adult and away, uh, a, a, a mago and away. So yeah, the, these are uh, these are some of the shortest ones um, in the UK. 
This is the same specimen as before, Patamantis luteus, and you can see the difference. It's got long front legs and long tails. And the long tails are, to, are thought to be to stabilize it in flight. And the long legs are because when the, the male and the female um, uh, mate, the male creates this swarm where it goes up. It does this flapping sort of spinning uh, flight where it goes up um, and then falls down, just sort of floats down and it keeps doing this um, in, in large numbers. Uh, and then the female will fly into the, the swarm when she's ready to mate. And the male has these big eyes, um, which it can then see the female above it. It will use its legs, its front legs, to actually put over the female and immobilize her wings, and then they'll mate. And as they're falling out of the uh, out of the swarm, they're mating. By the time they reach the ground or the water, the the female is mated and will fly away and lay her eggs. And the male is is practically dead. It's got very little energy left at all. Um, in this particular one, you can see that the, all the male has got here is the, the wing muscle here. They don't feed as adults, uh, mayflies, so they don't have any nothing in its gut at all. In a female, that would be coloured because it's it's got all the eggs in it. Um, and then the, in this, this male, all it's got here is the sperm packet that's going to pass over to the to the female. So really, just it's just there for one purpose, this... this uh, this uh, imago stage, which is to mate and, and pass on the, the sperm and then lay the eggs. Some examples of the of different species um, or, or, of, of, of the imago and the subimago in this species. This is one of the largest uh, mayflies, ephemera lineata, and you can see in the subimago the wings are quite opaque. And the reason for that is because there's actually two pairs of wings there. The, the, the imago's wings are inside there and they're covered by an outer, outer wing uh, covering. Um, you can see that the tails are relatively short and the, the legs relatively short here. These are females. Um, so you can see that the, the body is colored because it's got the eggs in it. Tails are much longer. Um, wings are, wings are uh, transparent and the, the legs are slightly longer as well. Okay, so that, that is the life cycle of the mayflies um, and a little bit about their, their sort of like um, history. And um, what I'd like to do for the rest of this talk is just to go through some of the identification. There's a lot of information here um, and it'll be, we are recording this, so you can go back and stop and look at some of the pictures uh, in a bit more detail, but uh, I'll rattle through it and we'll see how we get on. Um, and I'll take questions at the end. So identification of adult mayflies, there's a couple of books that can help you with this. There's the Freshwater Biological Association have a key to adults of British Ephemeroptera. It was written in 1983, so it is quite old and it doesn't have all the species in it. And it's still a, a quite usable key. Um, uh, I think it might be out of print, but you can get a, a, a photocopy from the FBA. Um, the other one that's here is the Naturalist Handbook on Mayflies, which was written by Janet Harker. Um, this has uh, roughly the same number of species as the as the FBA key. It's not got them all. Um, it's got some really easy to use keys in it. There are some mistakes, and and if you are if you have got this book, get in touch with me, and I can send you a, a, an erratum for them. Um, it's never been it's never been re republished, so we've not been able to get the mistakes uh, changed in it. And, and then finally, in in the 2010, um, Cyril Bennett and I uh, worked with the Field Studies Council to to produce a, a pictorial guide to British mayflies, and this is for both larvae and for adults. So it's got the adult uh, identification in there as well. There have been some, if you're using an older key, there have been some name changes and the nomenclature changes. So um, Amelitis and Opinatus moved from the Cyphlinuridae to the Amelitidae. Arthropleia congena uh, moved from Heptogenidae to Arthropleidae. And a few others changed their genus, so Centroptilum penilatum to Procleon, Femoral igniter to Ceratella igniter, Heptogenia fuscogrisa to Cagaronia and heterogenea lateralis to electrogenea lateralis. Um, so if you are using a, an older key 
and you see um, an odd name that you don't recognize, it's probably, that's probably the reason why. There's also, as I said, there's, there's some of the species were missing from those earlier keys. So there's actually um, fairly unusually for a group um, as well studied as, as mayflies, there's actually six new species since, since the mid eighties. Um, some of them are the, the, those tiny canis species, which are pretty difficult to identify. Um, and um, perhaps understandable that there's a few other species being there. Um, the Electrogena affinis was found in the River Derwent, and it's still the only river by the, I think, one of its tributaries, um, which where it's found, um, it's it seems to be a glacial relict in in that river, um, and doesn't seem to have got anywhere else in the country. Um, Betis atlanticus. Is, is really quite widespread. It was found um, following some molecular work, some DNA sequencing uh, that was done across Europe. And uh, the, the, the particular haplotype, the, the particular type of uh, DNA was, was also, had, had also been recorded from the UK. So we went out and looked for morphological features and, and uh, found this species in various rivers. And the final one, the most recent one, was Sithonurus oestivalis, which uh, uh, we we discovered by chance. Uh, Andrew Farr um, discovered by chance in a reservoir in in um, the south of England. He uh, we thought it was Sithonurus armatus, and then it just didn't really fit the key properly. And we did a bit more digging, looked at a, a few European keys, and discovered that it was this species, Sithonurus oestivalis. Um, which was a bit of a turn up and uh, started us looking at various other sites as well. Um, it's, I've got various rivers, it should actually be various lakes and still waters. It's, it's a still water species. Um, and it's been found in, in quite a few still waters now, including in, in the north of Scotland as well. So the, the um, FSC guide that the pictorial guide uh, is, is, as it says on the tin, it, it uses photographs um, and it's set out in a fairly easy to understand um, fashion. You go through the, the, the families first and then you go into uh, a, a flow chart type thing. So you've got a table where you just follow the, the right column in the table to take you to, not necessarily to a species, but to a group of species. And then you can look at the species accounts to take it further or go to the FBA key. So it's not designed to take you necessarily to a, a, a species, but it's to give you a, a, an easy way into Mayfly identification. So what I'll do is I'll run through some of these, the features that it uses. Um, the first thing you need to decide is whether it's a male or a female. As I explained in that last bit about the life cycles, the males um, on the right here, have got these forceps, which are appendages that lie underneath the tails. This is this is one of the tails. One of the tails is missing on this, this specimen. But you can see the forceps here, which are the things that it grabs onto the female with. It's also got the peens here, which are, are various shapes, as we'll see as we go along. The female doesn't have any of those features. It's just got the end of the abdomen and, the, in this case, three tails. Um, another feature we can look at for whether it's a male or a female is the eyes. As I said, that the the female eyes are quite small, but the male eyes are either have either got ex, extra eyes like these turbinate eyes, or the eyes are very large and on the top of the head. Um, and these, this, uh, this is a good feature to look out for as well, and um, to see if it's a male or a female. We need to look at whether it's an imago or a subimago, so that the the first stage that comes out of the water, or the second stage, and we can see here the opaque wings of the the of the uh, subimago. And the clear wings, the transparent wings of the imago. You can also see on the subimago, it's it's fringed with these little hairs, which, um, as I explained, are all are repellent hairs, uh, water repellent hairs that allows them to get out of the out of the the uh, water. Um, and we've seen we've seen this before. Just the difference between the two. You can see that there's it's quite a marked difference between the, the coloration. As we go forward, we'll see some of the other patterning. Most of the most of the imago wings are unpatterned, um, but some of the subimago wings can be patterned. Here's the yellow may done, uh, or the yellow may, 
and you can see it's got quite a different um, quite a difference between the, the submago here on the, the bottom, which is bright yellow and got yellow opaque yellow wings, um, and the imago, which is clear and it's got this bronzed effect um, around it. And Potamanthus lutius, the yellow mayfly, again the same idea. It's got this this yellow opaque wings. Um, yellow body and it's got much crisper, sharper colours in the in the imago. So another thing we need to look at is how many tails it's got. So as larvae, mayflies all have three tails in the UK, um, but as adults, they can have either three tails or two tails. Um, and basically, in the ones with two tails, they've they've evolved not to have that second that that middle um, filament. Uh, so it's the the newer, geologically speaking, evolutionarily speaking, uh, the newer species um, typically have the two tails. Um, so what we need to watch out for, though, is that there's not a breakage in one of the tails, like I showed in that, that previous one about the males and females. Um, if there is a breakage, you'll, you often see the little stump there with a little open hole in it. Um, in this one here, you can see that it's got, it's got the three tails. This one's got the two tails and a, a little stump of a tail there, but it's closed over. It's just a little protrusion um, instead of a, a hole, a, a broken um, tail. Uh, this, this number of tails is, is good to separate out the families. So two tails, you get these four families here, uh, the three families here, Siphonuridae, Heptogenidae, and Betidae. Um, in the, the three tails, you'll get these ones here. And so that's a really good way. Um, Potamanthus luteus isn't on this slide, but it, it also has, uh, Potamanthus has three tails as well. Um, so that's a really, really neat little um, thing to, to look at first. The other thing that you can look at to narrow down the options is the number of, the, the type of hind wings. Um, so we have either obvious hind wings, you know, big obvious hind wings that are perhaps a quarter of the size, well, a fifth to a quarter of the size of the main wing. Um, you've got tiny hind wings that are little oval shapes here, little oval flaps of, of wings. Uh, in the bottom left here, you get uh, spur-shaped hind wings, so tiny little slithers of wings. Um, quite difficult to see, so you need to be careful to make sure you've, you've seen it properly. And then in some species, there are no hind wings, so they've only got one pair of wings. Some of the keys also ask you about the free segments in the foot. Um, so in the tarsi, um, tarsal segments of the, the foot, some of them are actually fused to the, to the uh, tibia and others are actually free to move and bend. And in the beta day, you have three free tarsal, tarsal segments and then the others are fused. And you see here uh, in, in Procleon bifidum, there's um, the, the fuse, first fuse section is um, three times the length of the, of the second segment. So that's one of the features that's picked up in the key. In, in this one here, you've got four free segments um, in the Amelita day and the Siphonura day. You see how they, they bend there, and that's one of the features we can use. You can actually use a, a forcep to, to try and bend them and see how they flex. And in the heptogenidae and the Arthropleia day, you've got five free segments. So this is kind of the summary of that. You've got, uh, you can look at the number of tails first, you look at the, uh, then look at the type of hind wings, and then you can split your, your, um, your choices down into, into these groups. And then if you go further with the two tails, you can look at the tarsal segments um, and split them down further. For the three tails, you need to start looking at wing venation. Um, so wing venation, this is typical, this is a typical mayfly wing. You see it's got lots of uh, uh, cross veins. The, uh, these longitudinal veins coming down here, which are all num uh, named at the ends, um, and it takes a little bit of a while to get used to the, the naming and the numbering and, and which is which, but it's, it's usually quite simple to work out once you've, if you've got a diagram like this. Um, the hind wing's the same, it's got various cross veins and longitudinal veins that are important. This one down here is uh, one of the, uh, is, is the, um, one of the canidae, 
and you can see it's got really reduced venation. It's not got all these these cross veins, um, but you can still work out what the the longitudinal veins are. We also have um, things called intercalary veins, which are important. So you see these are little detached veins that go along the edge of the wing margin. And in this case, there's single intercalaries between the longitudinal veins. And this one here is double. And that's important when you're looking at um, the beta day in particular. So just some uh, other features here. You can see um, various features here in the heptagenidae and uh, arthropleidae. You're looking at these cubital intercalaries, so these little, these unconnected, these veins that don't connect at the base. Um, and there's two pairs of them, which is characteristic of that, that family. In the Siftonuridae and Amelitidae, they've got these wavy intercalary veins on, on the first cubital vein, and it's got these sinusoidal sort of uh, uh, veins, which is easy to see with the hand lens. Um, there's other features in the, in the um, in the hind wings that you can use, um, so um, particularly in, in separating out heptogenidae from arthropleidae, this fork in the veins, um, which is called the outer fork, um, is absent in the arthropleidae. And in the cyclinuridae and amelitidae, you're looking at the, the tarsal claws. One is pointed and the other is dissimilar in, uh, is uh, sort of like this sort of blunt in the amyl, in uh, Amelitis and Ognatis, in Siphonurus, both claws are sharp. Uh, in in the Ephemeridae and the Leptoflubidae and Potamanthidae, you, you're and, and the Ephemeralidae, you're looking at um, the base of the wing and looking at how the, the relative distance between the different veins, of, between the two cubital veins and the, the anal vein. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because it's it's quite difficult to see on the images. But basically, um, in in some of them they're they're uh, arched, like this one here. This one here is evenly spread between the two, so the even gap uh, here. And then this one here, which is really difficult to see, is um, the uh, cubit one of the cubital veins is closer to the other than to the anal vein. Um, other things you can just see here, there's another point here, this has got single intercalary veins, so that's another thing that you can actually um, pick out straight away. So there are issues with identification, um, you can't identify all adult mayflies. Um, mostly in the beta day, there's, there's big problems with looking at uh, females, they're not easy to separate at all, there's, no, there's really no features um, that are, are reliable. So you can only really look at males and only at male imagos, so the, the last adult stage for most of them. In Betis Atlanticus and Betis Rodani, you can you can um, at least separate them out into a group with the sub-imago stage, but to get a full identification, you need a male imago. And in Betis Digitatus and Betis Niger, you also need male imagos um, to get an identification. In the heterogeneity, um, generally you can do them, uh, no problem, but the ecti and neurus are, are difficult, particularly the, these particularly three species. Um, you can do, some of my goals are pretty easy to do on the, on the wing patterning, which we'll see in a minute, but the male of my goals are, uh, can be a bit variable. Um, there are features that are used in the keys, but they're, they're not they're not always uh, accurate. I, I've, I've had some imagos that are clearly one species come out as a different species when you look at the imago. So in the beta day, we look at the wing finish, uh, the, the hind wing to start with, um, and then a little bit about the, if there's if the no hind wing, we look at the segments of the foot. Um, in in Procleon and the Chloeon species, we're looking at the alignment of the cross veins here in the, the uh, tip of the wing. You can see in Procleon bifidum, the, the, light, the cross veins line up. You can see them there, they're joining each other. Um, whereas in the Chloeon species, they, they don't line up, they're staggered, um, which is the easy way to separate them. When you're looking at uh, Chloeon, between Chloeon diptrum and Chloeon simile, Chloeon diptrum has got this, as an imago, it's got the, the females have got this beautiful 
bronzed um, stripe down the costal region. Um, but the best way to separate them is the is the in the pterostigma. Um, this has got the clue on similarly has got ten veins and uh, clue on diptions only got three or four. The spur wings, the shape of the spur, uh, the the hind wing is is key. In Centroptum luteolum, there's a, a point to the the spur which we can see just here, whereas in Procleon penilatum, um, it's rounded. Procleon penilatum also uh, characteristically holds its wings like this, splayed slightly when it's at rest, um, whereas Centroptum will hold them closed. So that's another sort of like little giveaway um, on that species. The betis species are uh, everybody, everybody hates them. <laughs> nobody, nobody likes identifying them. Um, they're they're really tricky. Um, there are some things that you can do that you can uh, use. The uh, they've all all the beta species have got two paired double uh, intercalary veins between the big veins that you can see in this top image here. Um, the Beta Sridani and Beta Atlanticus in the subimago have got just between the wings on the on the back of the thorax. There's these two open circles, look a bit like a set of eyes. Um, that's a, a good feature for separating those two species out. There's also um, some of the uh, species have got quite distinctive eye colouring. So Beta Fuscatus in the males has got this bright yellow eye. Um, uh, you can see that the, the females don't have the same turbinate eye there. On the hindwing itself, there's this thing called a costal process or spur. Um, it's near the base of the hindwing, and uh, all the beta species have this apart from beta satrobatinus. Um, if you've got if you've got if you've got a, a, a hindwing without a costal process, then it's like that. It's going to be beta satrobatinus. At, at um, in the other ones, uh, you can look at the wing venation of the hindwing. Um, so most have three veins, like shown in the bottom left here, uh, and they're just simple veins that go along the along the wing membrane. Some have the second vein uh, forked, so you can see here in the Betis muticus, there's the top the top uh, vein is is simple, and the bottom vein is simple, um, but the middle one is forked, and some only have two veins. And the ones that only have two veins always have the fork. So what you really need to do is you need to be you need to look carefully for this vein. It can be quite close to the the margin of the wing um, and can be overlooked. But uh, this one never; these two never have it. Um, I won't go into too much detail on this, but this is these are the the forceps of the the betis males, and various uh, combinations of different features help can help you separate out the uh, different species. So you can see uh, some of it is, is swellings on the, the basal segment. There's a tooth on Betis vernus, which is a bit um, uh, variable, to be honest. And there's restrictions, so like where it goes waste, a little bit wasted and um, be between the two segments uh, and so on. These are all in the keys, in the FBA key, these, these features are all in there. Um, and we hope to be able to make these sort of images available soon as well. Uh, moving on to the canidae, um, these are tiny insects. Um, you know, the, the smallest is about three millimeters, the biggest probably about six or seven. Uh, they're really different, difficult to, to identify because of their size. Um, the, First thing is to look for to split the two genera out uh, in Brachycerus circus. Um, there's a wide area between the the front legs and um, the the cocks of the front legs. So this is the cocks are here, um, and there's a big wide area between them. In the canis, the cocks are actually inserted towards the middle of the insect. So there's a much narrower area between them. Um, the other feature we're looking for is a spine on the dorsal surface of the um, the second body segment. Uh, it it never looks quite as obvious as this, but that's the sort of thing that you're looking for. 
Um, most, most of the time you need to get the lighting correct to actually see this. Um, but if you persevere, you will see it and other features will help you. If it's a male particularly, you'll be able to use the other features to um, identify it. Of the two um, species here, Canis uh, luctuosa and Macrura, the, you need to look at the abdomen and the, 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 the thin part of the uh, abdomen, sorry, the antenna. The thin part of the antenna, um, if you look at the base of that in Luctuosa, it's, it's, it's swollen, whereas in Macrura it isn't. There are very few other features to actually separate these. These are the, the genitalia of the, the males, and you can see there's, they're, they're quite, quite useful to identify them with. They are quite fairly distinctive, and if you put these in combination with the other features, um, you should be able to identify them. There are other, there are other features such as markings, grayish markings on the abdominal segments, which are, which are, um, well, if you've got enough specimens and you can compare them, there you can you can use them. The ephemeralidae, and um, there's only two species in the UK, uh, rel relatively easy to separate out. Ephemerella nutata has this this markings on the underside, these dots and dots and uh, stripes, uh, Ceratella lignita doesn't, although in some rivers um, it's, it's got a much darker uh, body colour, but in some rivers, particularly if there's a light substrate like a chalk stream, you can sometimes see a pattern um, through, through the, the, the background colour, but it's never as distinctive as, as this. Um, so if you've if we're looking again at the the genitalia, so if you've got FM, if you've got those markings, you should have these this this shape of uh, penis lobes here, um, long and pointed. Whereas in in Ceratella ignita, it's more of a U shaped notch between them. The ephemeridae are, are relatively simple to separate. There's three species. Um, they're all separated on the basis of the body markings. Um, which are really usually quite distinctive, and um, we can see them here. So, um, in Ephemera danica, they have uh, the the last couple of segments of the body have dark markings on them, and the others either don't have them at all or they're very faint. In Ephemera bulgata, in the middle picture here, they've got these distinctive triangles. Um, Usually they're a bit they're a bit wider than that and a bit chunkier than that, um, but they can be uh, as thin and, and um, delicate as that as well. And in the ephemera lineata, there's um, a series of stripes, um, so they've they've got uh, a, a series of of lines on them on all of the segments of the body. Um, as you, sometimes you get ephemera danica that have got a bit of washed out colour in the in the, the segments, um, they'll, the way to separate them from the ephemeral lineata, sometimes they'll look a bit similar, that certainly the last couple of segments of the body, is to look further up the body and, and in ephemera danica, there won't be markings, whereas in ephemera lineata, there will be. And you can, if you've got a male, you can have a look at the, the forceps in this case to look at the, the difference in this, this length of the different segments to um, separate the species. Heterogeneity is another big group of uh, mayflies in the UK. They are relatively easy to separate as subimagos, a little bit more difficult to separate as, um, as imagos. Uh, Ruthogenia species, two, two Ruthogenia species can be separated by this the, the dot on their femur. You can see here it's got this uh, plain femur with a dark mark right in the center of it on each leg. And that is that's characteristic of Ruthogena. In Ectionurus, Ectionurus species, um, they are typically have these dark diagonal marks on the body, um, which are really distinctive. Um, uh, they they never have a dark body, a uh, completely dark body, whereas the Ruthogena species may. Um, in the Electrogena species, this is the one with the yellow streak or the yellow or orange streak down the. The base, so it's typically a, a dark fly with a with a, a coloured, a lighter pale streak across the, the wing bases. 
And then the heterogeneous species are bright yellow. And um, there's two species, one that's thought to be extinct, um, heterogeneous longicoda and a heterogeneous sulfuria, which is really quite common. It's also got these lovely sort of dark feet, which is quite characteristic as well. And the final heterogeneity is Cageronia fuscagrisia. Um, this one always trips me up. Um, I always think it's something else. And then I realized, no, it's got this, this arm band on. It's got this flesh colored band on the, the femur. Um, and that's, that's the, the, the giveaway for this species. And you can look at the, the genitalia again. So you can see, as I was saying there, the, the different types of, uh, the, the, each genus has a different type of um, shape of penis lobe. So the Ruthogenia ones are, are long and thin like that. The, um, the ectineurus are, are T-shaped. Um, the electrogenia is like a love heart um, and various other shapes here. The, um, the two Ruthogenia species, you can separate them on the basis of, as a subimago, you can separate them on the basis of the wing pattern. So Ruthogenia germanica has this patterned wing, whereas Ruthogenia semicolata is a plain grey wing. And then as the imago, you can look at the, the genitalia of the males. It's a plain uh, penis lobe in the, the March brown in Ruthogenia germanica, and it's got a hooked uh, lobe on the olive upright Ruthogenia semicolorata. Ectineurus subimagos, um, they, they are relatively easy to do with the wing patterns. Um, the, it's all to do with the, the cross veins and whether they're all colored or not. So you can see in this one here, um, there's a, a yellow edge to the wing as well. Um, there's a band, the, the coloring is in bands across the wing, whereas in uh, Ectoronis venosus, it's, it's much more evenly distributed, the, 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 the black markings. And this one here is um, this one here is a slightly different um, thing. I'll show that in a minute. Uh, in Ectoronis uh, dispar, the wings are plain. There's no dark markings on the on the um, on the wings on the cross veins. In Ectoronis in Cygnus, um, if you turn it upside down, you can see this this patterning on the underside. You can actually see it on that individual there, um, just there. And uh, yeah, that's a good place to start when you're looking to see to rule that one out straight away. Um, the genitalia, uh, the some of it is the shape of the, the the lobes, although they can be a bit variable. Um, there's a set of teeth on some of these. So these two species here, Trentus and Dispar, have got teeth on the the forceps base, um, whereas the other two don't. Um, it, it's it's a bit variable. You're, you're much better if you've got a subimago with the ectineurus um, species. Leptothlebidae, uh, a fairly small group, six species. Um, there's various things that we we look at in these to do with the hind wing and then the, um, the uh, tibia. In Habrophlebia fusca, it's got a costal process, not as sharp as the Betis uh, costal process, but still a sort of little, little thumb on the on the wings, like a pair of mitts. And whereas in the Leptophlebia and Paraleptophlebia, they don't have that. Uh, in Paraleptophlebia, we're looking at the, um, we can separate them from the Leptophlebia by the the position of CU, uh, the cubital veins and the anal veins. You can see the anal vein is closer to cubital two than to cubital one. And then we can look at the genitalia for, for a species ID. Um, if it's got patterned wings, it'll be this species here, submarginata. If it's got plain gray wings, it's one of these two species and they've got quite different uh, genitalia. The leptophlebia species, if it's got, if you look at the hind wings in a, in a subimago, um, if they're the, both the same color, it'll be this species here, marginata. And you can double check by looking at the, the rounded top of the, of the uh, genitalia, the penis lobes. If the, pale, if the hind wings are paler than the, 
the the forewings, it'll be Vespertina. And sometimes you get these two species uh, co-occurring. Vespertina's got a hooked tip to the to the genitalia. And the final group, um, Cyphlinuridae and Amelitidae, uh, explained earlier on about the the different shaped claws on the foot, and that's one of the features that we we use. Um, and then for the Cyphlinura species, we're looking at uh, the genitalia in the males. Uh, they've got quite distinctive genitalia. Uh, the, these are the, the penis lobes um, of those, those four species. In Armatus, it's got this big extended, drawn out um, uh, ninth segment where there's a pointed edge there and it's much, much wider than the other segments. If you turn it upside down, you'll also see that the eighth segment, so the one before that expanded section, has an interned um, point, interned spine that's underneath the body, whereas in Easter Vallis um, and the others, it doesn't have that. Okay, so that's identification. Um, let's just finish off with a little bit about collecting mayflies. Um, this is a picture of uh, this is a picture that got me into mayflies actually. This is a picture of somebody uh, crossing the Mississippi during one of the big mayfly hatches and having to move the mayflies off the road for him to actually get his car through. Uh, I just love the fact that you see them all up his legs there and they're like iron filings on a magnet um, up the, the uh, bonnet of the car. Just amazing. So mayflies can be collected by all the usual techniques. You can brush them off of trees onto a beating tray. Um, uh, or you can use a beating tray to, to knock them off of the branches. Um, it's a really good technique also to get the exuvia. So anything, if they've crawled out of the water, you can, you can brush uh, off, off, the, uh, um, off rocks and things and, and posts and, and bridge supports onto a tray. Um, you can also use, you don't have to use a, a beating tray like this. You can use a, an umbrella or anything like that, just um, something to catch them as you, you brush down. You can sweep them from vegetation um, uh, alongside rivers and, and lakes, or you can um, capture them in flight and, and get them into your, your tube. Um, I tend not to use a, a putter for, for taking um, mayflies because you, they, they tend to get a bit mashed up and, and broken. So I'll usually try and pot them in the, in the, in the net if possible. They're also, as I said, attracted to light, so you can run a, a, a standard light trap to get them. With a standard light trap, you tend to get quite a lot of, you obviously get quite a lot of moths as well, and uh, quite a lot to go through. So we have been using a, a different method for for all the river flies, actually, mayflies, particularly mayflies and caddisflies, um, which is one that's pioneered by the caddisfly collective in, in the States. This is a a homemade light trap. Um, you, there's two versions that you can use. This one is with a, a tray with some water and a, a little drop of um, fairy liquid in it to break the surface tension. And the the insects are attracted to the UV light and then land in the water and, and you can collect them from there. Um, or or you can use the same technique. This is the this is the actual thing here. So it's a, a piece of plumbing tube, 25 mil plumbing tube and a UV light strip from, uh, from uh, online wrapped around it. It's an adhesive thing. Um, it's powered by a, a mobile phone charging pack. Um, and then you can put it out. It lasts for a couple of hours at most. Um, this is an adaptation to the, the water trap method, which Stuart Cross has devised, which is using a, a white um, mesh laundry basket hanging it from a tree and hanging the, the light tube inside it. And it's really effective. You can actually see all the caddis flies on, on the outside of this one here. Once you've got your um, mayflies, uh, the recording scheme would be really interested in your records. So you made an identification. Uh, we use iRecord almost exclusively now. Uh, we prefer to get records through here because it makes the verification process a lot easier. Um, you also get the opportunity then to to look at other people's specimens. This is a stonefly rather than a mayfly, but uh, it illustrates the point. Um, you know, so if, if I've gone on and I've verified a record and you can go and then look at your, 
your specimen and compare it to what the verified specimen is. We also, um, I also do quite a lot on social media. I'll post things about different um, species um, uh, when, I, when I remember. Um, there's also a few other people that do that as well. So Paul Proctor is one who is a, uh, who's a, an angler who's actually um, often spotting a lot of the species and, and will post them on, uh, on, on Twitter as well. Also have a, a blog, which uh, um, I post on fairly irregularly, to be honest. Um, but there's lots of information on there about identifying different species um, and the species accounts for, for uh, I think, all the mayflies in, uh, in the UK, maybe not the newest two. Um, but there's things like mayfly of the month and identification guides and, and conservation issues and the like. Um, my only problem is, is finding the time to, to post these sort of things. But. So uh, that's the end of my talk. I'd, I'd like to thank um, particularly Ray Lockyer and Cyril Bennett for the use of their images, um, which uh, to actually illustrate this talk. I'd also like to thank um, Liana Dixon and Gary Hedges for organizing the talk and giving me the opportunity to talk to you tonight. As Liana said, there's a workshop on mayflies, adult mayflies at the World Museum in Liverpool on the 21st of May, um, where we can look at specimens and, and do some identification there and information is on the on the website there the there's some links that you can go to if you want to find out more about mayflies um as i said my my day job is is as conservation director at bug life um and there's a lot of information on the bug life website about mayflies uh, and other and other river flies um we uh the recording schemes all feed into the river fly partnership and on the Riverfly Partnership website, riverflies.org, is uh, there's pages about different species on there as well. That's the link to my blog, um, and then the link to uh, iRecord, and finally my Twitter handle if you want to interact with me on Twitter. Thank you. That was absolutely fascinating, Craig. From just from the you know from the history of mayflies and the literature through to uh, yeah, Lake Sinclair, Rain Radar. I'd, I'd never heard of that, but it's, yeah, that's just, yeah, amazing stuff. And then, you know, it, just extremely useful as well, going through all that ID stuff. Um, so it's, yeah, it's gonna be really useful for people, especially with the recording as well for probably year, years to come, I suppose, on, on YouTube, I, I hope. Um, so, Thank you so much, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're happy to take a few questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, if, that's, if that's right, um, I'll, I'll start actually because I can. <laughs> um, I was just I was interested by you talking about the hyperheric zone. Am I pronouncing that right? Hyperheric, yeah. Hi hyperheric, sorry. Yeah. Um, and how how do you access that to to sample it? So there's a, there's a couple of techniques. Um, there's a technique uh, where you you dig a hole in a gravel beach and you get down to the water level and and you just basically dig a hole and then bail it out and get the water that's coming through the gravel. Um, the other way is to hammer a pipe in and actually pump the water out from whatever depth you want to go down to. The digging a hole is a lot easier than hammering the pipe in. Right. Okay. All oh, right. Cool. Well, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to see that happen. Um, okay, I will move on to then. So, uh, Leanna's been saving some of the questions that have been in the chat. So I'll I'll, I'll sort of whiz through these. So that these first two are sort of connected. So I'll say them both at the same time. Um, so firstly, there was from. Um, Mike Ashworth saying, does the sub amigo stage, Margo stage, have a specific purpose or is it an evolutionary relic? And then there was Sarah Cooney was sort of re responding to that, saying, assume there must be an adaptive advantage for having sub amigo and then amigo stages since the insect is very vulnerable. Is it so the front legs and tails can get longer, but then? Canis sub imago 
to Imago happen so quickly, why do they have it at all? So, well, uh, I think Sarah's probably answered the question uh, quite well there. It, it, is, uh, it is thought to be because they can't achieve that change to, to the, sex, the fully sexually mature, the, the one that needs to, to swarm um, and needs those features such as the long legs and, and tails. It, it is thought that they can't do that in one go. Um, but to reality, they've, been, they've been doing it for for millions of years um and trying to work out why they do it is 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 tricky i think that the the, the question about the canis uh subimagos is 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 a good one um and there are some species i think there is a species that no longer does that molt um in in south america i can't remember the, the name of it um so that there is a there is a i guess there is an evolutionary uh move towards losing that but the older species will, will will retain it i guess right um um sarah or mike did you have any follow-up to to that if you want to unmute yourself no that that's great thank you craig very interesting great okay so the, there was um next question i have here was from charlie do the stated fly sizes just relate to the body or does it include tail length? Uh, no, it's the body. It's the body. Body, okay. All right, that's, that's a nice simple one. That's nice and easy, yeah. <laughs> okay, and a question from Steve Gator. Can you kindly share homemade light trap designs? Yeah, I will do that. I will I will write something up and I'll give it to Gary to uh, circulate or Gary or Leanne to circulate. Great, thank you. Um, I've I've heard of those recently. There's ones with the the, the power packs actually. I, I I don't know where that came up before, but yeah, people talking think, about the US. I think I I think I talked about it somewhere else, but I can't remember where right. myself either. <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, then from, from Dave Appleton, uh, really great talk. Thanks, Craig. A lot of fantastic ID information given that isn't in the books. Um, at least not clearly illustrated. Will you be publishing this? Hopefully. Um, I hope to speak to the um, Freshwater Biological Association about updating their um, adult key, because like I said, it was pub last published in 1983. It's missing at least six species. Um, and I think the things have moved on and we can do some of these, we can put some of these illustrations in alongside the, the more traditional illustrations. Well, yeah, it's 40 years ago now then, isn't it? Yeah, that's... I know, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I keep thinking it's only about 20 years ago. <laughs> well, okay, and now uh, a question from uh, T. Davis, really excellent talk, thank you. You mentioned making the images available. Does this mean you're working on a new guide slash key? I think you've just... Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I would like to do. We will be we'll be doing another version of the um, FSC key soon because we've got a lot more pictures of the the, the, the species. And Cyril's been working on getting pictures of all the, all the species, so we'll, we'll be able to fully illustrate that. But I would like to do... Uh, that doesn't go into the detail of the genitalia and the other features that I was showing there. So I would like to do that with the, the Freshwater Biological Association and update their key. Yeah. Yeah, sounds great. Um, and then, okay, there's a question from Angela Price. I've heard that ephemeralid, sure I'm saying that wrong, um, mm -hmm. nymphs do a scorpion movement when disturbed. Is this so? Uh, well, they, yes, they can. Um, so the ephemeralidae uh, have uh, their their gills are on their back, so they they're on on the surface of their their back, and they move them all the time and and disturb the water uh, to get get oxygen from the water, and they they'll often be you'll often see them tip their tails right the way forward, so it's pointing over their over their heads, and what I think that is probably the, what they're probably doing there is actually masking the the flow of water from their gills. Because you can imagine if you're putting off all this, if you're flapping your gills all the time and there's water shooting out behind you, that's a real 
obvious thing for a fish or other predator to latch onto and come and get you from behind when you can't see them. So if they tip their tails over, I reckon that's probably just pushing the water out a different way. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, oh, question, and now on to the bottom of the chat. So um, from David Broom, what hand lens would you recommend for mayflies? Uh, a 10 times hand lens is, is fine. I use a 10 times hand lens. I've got a 20 times, but I rarely use it. Um, but yeah, just a folding um, 10 times hand lens one. I don't know if you'll see it because I've got my background now, but one like, one like, whoops, that. Um, the, the good thing with these is that if you've got a plastic one, um, you can stick a bit, like I've done here, you can stick a bit of uh, blue tack on the back of it and then get your phone, stick that over, stick that onto your, the case of the back of your phone um, like that. Oh, I don't know if you'll see it I need to get near my face, I think. I might need to, no, no not going to do it. Um, and uh, oh, you might see it there. Uh, there. Oh, yeah. Maybe. And then over the camera, and then you've got a 10 times lens on your camera. Okay, that's a good tip. And that, and that works, does it? That works. Absolutely really. works. Okay. So you right, no, need, gonna... no need to buy one of these uh, clip on things. You can just use your hand lens, which you've got with you anyway. Right. I'm going to try that out tomorrow. That's a, that's a good <laughs> tip. Thanks. And, and do you. <clears throat> I guess you you do a good portion of them out in the field, do you, with the, with the ID? Yeah, most of them can be done in the field. I mean, the, there are, like I said, there's, there's difficulties with identification with some of them. So, so some of them you've got to bring back. And uh, there's, there's always, the, the one that always throws me is Cagaronia um, Fusca Grisia, because I always think it's something completely different. And then I'll, I'll bring it back and I'll go, no. Nah, I can see it now. I know exactly what it is. That um, band the other one on is, the leg. Yeah, the band, the, the arm bands. Um, and uh, yeah, it throws me every year. The very first one I see, I get it wrong. Um, and then I realise what I've done. Okay, great. It must be coming up to, is it? But Well, stoneflies are before on the mayflies, aren't they, mainly? Um, so Beta Sridani will emerge all through the year. So I've seen them in January, I've seen them in December okay. um, and every month. Uh, and so will uh, Clue on Dip Trim. That's, that's one that you'll find in garden ponds and coming to light in your house. Um, it's uh, the March Brown is out uh, in March, as it would suggest. Uh, and then the, the main peak season for Mayflies is sort of May to July. And then it tails off again. Um, the they're called I, I didn't say it in my talk but the may they're called mayflies um partly because the most the, the common um large one in the uk is around in may but it's it's thought to be because they're there is to do with mayflower rather than the than the month so it's when the uh the the peak flowering of hawthorn is is on the go that's when the mayflies are on the go as well Wow, okay, yeah, didn't know that. Uh, great. Has anybody else got any questions? No, there's no more in the chat. So if, if you'd like to unmute yourself, then you're, you're very welcome to and ask a question. Um, just trying to see if that's a question there. Okay, so oh, there is a question then here in the chat now from Richard Bartley. Thank you. Uh, reference to warmer winters in the south and some species missing their winter diapause phase and enabling two generations a year. Which species, please? That's uh, Serratella ignita, the blue winged olive. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else with a question for Craig? Oh, oh, what's, uh, okay, here we go. Um, okay, from, from Jackie Carter. Um, river water pollution is making the news headlines. How much does this impact on mayflies? Um, 
it has a big impact on mayflies, not all species. I mean, the Beta Sudani is, is pretty tolerant of organic pollution, but but pesticide pollution will, will wipe out most mayflies. Um, they're pretty intolerant of pesticides. Um, some species are, are particularly affected by nutrients. Uh, so there's been some work that's looked at phosphorus impacts on, on mayflies, and yeah, some species are, are more uh, impacted by, by nutrients than others. So yeah, you can tell quite a lot about um, water quality from the invertebrates in the river and uh, you know what the, the different species that are that there or not there or should be there. Okay, so are, are they as useful indicators as other river fly groups? Uh, yeah, so the, 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 the key the key groups that you know for for uh, water quality are the mayflies, stoneflies and caddisflies. Um, stoneflies are more tolerant of acidic conditions, um, heavy metals. Mayflies, absolutely not tolerant of, uh, of acidic conditions, apart from some of the leptophlebidae. Um, so you'll find them up in PT um, streams. The, but the, the stoneflies are really intolerant of organic pollution. Most of them are intolerant of organic pollution and nutrient pollution, whereas the, stone, the mayflies, some of them are, are quite tolerant of that. So. It all depends what you're looking for and, and what what uh, what you find. Okay, great. Um, okay, then we've got a, a couple more questions in now. So, uh, one from Andrew Kenny. Um, thank you for your talk. Do you know if there are any reference photos for Betis Atribatinus um, larvae? Uh, let me think about that. I was thinking of a different species there. Um, there are. I don't think there's any, I don't know if I've got any pictures of the larvae. Um, the, the the features are are quite subtle. It's a it's a feature on the antennae that you you need to look for. It's a little protrusion on the antennae. Um, it's it's well illustrated in the FBA key to larvae, um, but I don't think I've got a picture of that. I need to double check with Cyril if he's got a picture. Okay. Uh, if if you have one, is there a way to? I yeah, we could. I could. Um, if I've got one, I I'll I'll either contact you and we can get in touch with Andrew. Um, I'm guessing you've got his contact details. Uh. Possibly, possibly, yeah, possibly through the event, right? Or, yeah. or if Andrew wants yeah. to get in touch with me, yeah. um, then that would be that would be fine. Yeah, and I think you're you well, you're on social media and stuff, yeah. and you you already put that on, so yeah. yeah, great. Okay, and then thank you, Andrew. Uh, at, and then there's a question from Angela Price: Do beta D use the the flow drift more than most? Um, so there have been some studies on this by Malcolm Elliott up in the Lake District, and uh, the different species use the you go into drift um, in different numbers. I've, my I can't recall exactly, but I do know that beta they do go into drift quite a lot, um, whereas the heptagenidae do stay uh, are more more settled in where they they stay. Partly because they they need to be in the faster flowing water, they can't afford to drift into the the slower flowing water. Um, so there there are studies and um, there's there's papers on this. Uh, the River Dodden, I think it was that Malcolm Elliott worked on, um, and there's he's got detailed information. There's a set there's a type of uh, net you can use, which is basically like a a, a, a sampling net, but you you hammer two posts and uh, two poles into the river, and leave it there overnight and and it catches the drift of invertebrates right okay great right uh, another question these are a very well informed audience <laughs> these are not not the most simple questions really very good they're very good okay can so from uh susanna taylor can fine sediment affect the habitat of early nymph instars 
Absolutely. Um, yeah. So when I explain, when I was saying that the the early instars go down into the gravel, if those holes in the gravel are blocked up with uh, sediment, they're not going to be able to get down into the gravel. Not going to be able to get down into that hyperreic zone um, where they're safe. So you know, and 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 likewise, if they're in there and then there's a big load of sediment goes in and and covers that over, that's going to block their escape back out. So sediment is a is is potentially a big problem for these sort of species. Right. There are some though that you I mean the canis species and the uh, uh, ephemera species um, live in the sand, not not just necessarily the silt, but the the sand that is in amongst all those stones. So they they quite prefer it. Um, so yeah, there's there's it, it depends what species. Okay, thank you, Craig. Um, I, I was thinking, are, are there any, um, well, not, I don't know of any around uh, Northwest England.